Well, hello everyone, and uh, how's it going? How are you doing? How are you surviving this once in a lifetime situation? What are you learning about yourself? I think I've realized how much I enjoy routine. I think I've realized that if there are snacks available in the house that I will be all over them. Uh, but it's not all grit and determination and having a, a stiff upper lip. Many of us are dealing with a considerable amount of concern and anxiety. Uh, worried about what the future may hold. Worried about uh, our financial futures, our health. Thinking about uh, things we're struggling with mentally and emotionally. Some of us have been struggling physically with the symptoms of this terrible disease. Maybe uh, even today, you're having to fight mentally for uh, your mental health. If only we could get some peace, right? If only we could have a, a quiet hour in the sunshine. Reassurance that our loved ones will be okay. A sense that things are, are under control. Uh, relief from our money concerns. Even just someone to talk to. Who knows where we're really coming from. If I was to say to you, I really want some peace in my life right now, what would that mean for you? What picture would that conjure up for you? It's not just coronavirus, though, is it? Many things in life prevent us from that experience of, of peace that we want so much. We shouldn't be surprised. Jesus was, Jesus was clear that in this life we will all have trouble. He was also clear that he wants his followers to receive his gracious gift of peace. How then can we experience peace in our lives despite the circumstances that sometimes almost constantly seem to, to bombard us? If that peace is not a, a quiet corner with a nice beverage, then what is it? Well, today we're going to look in the book of Philippians. This was written by one of the church leaders called Paul. Uh, so if you want to turn to Philippians chapter 4. Uh, Paul wrote this when he was uh, imprisoned himself. He was writing to a church that was being persecuted from outside. That had divisions internally. And Paul was writing when he was... Yeah, our equivalent is locked down to a certain extent. He wasn't socially distancing because he was, he was probably chained to a jailer as far as we know. But even so, he's writing and he certainly is in a position to offer us instruction about peace today. So from this passage today, we're going to look at those two questions. How can we experience peace? I've called that the roots of peace. And what does peace look like, which I've called the fruits of peace, the roots of peace and the fruits of peace. You can tell I'm enjoying the gardening at the moment, can't you? So first of all, the roots of peace in our lives. How can we experience peace? Paul writes in our passage that we will receive the peace of God if we're doing three things. One upward one outward and one inward. In fact, Paul states them as commands that we should follow. So the first root of peace, uh, upward, is what he says in verse 4. Rejoice. Look with me there. Chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Literally, rejoice now. And I will keep telling you to rejoice. And you might well say, is this some kind of weird masochist to be to be saying rejoice right now? It's a fair point. It doesn't it seem really bizarre, even just plain wrong, for Paul to tell us to be joyful when things are really bad, when we are filled with worry and grief, maybe even anger. How is it possible for us to express joy in the middle of the COVID nineteen situation? Well, it does not say, 
does not only say rejoice, but he gives us an object of our joy in the Lord. It is not in our circumstances that we're being told to rejoice. That would be masochistic and weird. It is God that we're told to rejoice in. The command to the followers of Jesus is to rejoice in the Lord, not in our circumstances. Our circumstances will change moment by moment. But God never changes. God has always been a good, perfect, just, loving creator. And although we let him down every day, even making him angry with our disobedience, we should still rejoice in the Lord. We should rejoice because he did not leave that as being the end of our relationship. As we were thinking about over Easter, God sent his son, Jesus, to die in our place and to restore the relationship that we had broken with God. Jesus came to make peace. So yes, the followers of Jesus should rejoice because we have had our relationship with God restored. He is even now acting with our best interests at heart. He has saved us with his grace. He has equipped us for all good things. He has adopted us as sons and daughters. He has given us the gifts of his spirit. We should be rejoicing. Rejoicing in, in who God is and what he has done for us, despite who we are and what we have done. And this is the first root that Paul is suggesting to us of peace. The second root we can see is there in verse 5. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. The outward root, the outward root is to let your gentleness be evident. Some of your Bibles might have a word like a reliable or generous, uh, but in the original language when it's been used in the bible it's most often translated as gentleness that we can't avoid conflict in life it's in, in, in an it is an inevitable result of different opinions of limited resources the question is how are we going to deal with that conflict that is what matters are we going to try and win at any cost are we going to try and wring the last ounce of benefit from a situation? Will we defend our position to the last? Will we protect our non-existent rights or just our really selfish desires? The second part of Romans 12 speaks about this. There in verse 18 we're told, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Jesus desired that we should have peace, commended peacemakers and lived a life modelling peacemaking. His followers should be the same. Our gentleness should be evident to all. Colin Smith describes this gentleness as a shock absorber in a car. Have you ever been in a car where the shock absorber is gone? Every bump in the road is transmitted to the passengers. It feels like you've hit every pothole that exists on your journey. Gentleness is like a shock absorber that's working well. Conflict is calmed. Minor offences are absorbed and, and overlooked. Major offences are dealt with, with with compassion and truth. We think well of others until we know otherwise. We're quick to apologise. We're going to let God deal with the righteous anger, if, if that's necessary. That's what he does. He's a just God. Instead, let us be peacemakers. So when we act with gentleness towards others, this will be the second root of our own peace. So the first upward root is rejoice in the Lord. The second outward root, be gentle towards others, which brings us to the third root, the inward root, pray. Look there in verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. There are different kinds of prayer, aren't there? Paul here commands us to make our requests known. He calls that a, that's called a petition. Make our requests known to God and to make them known with thankfulness. With thankfulness. 
Why is this an inward root of peace? Surely it's upward again to God, right? Well, well, I want to suggest to you that it's inward because in this verse we can see that this prayer is an antidote to worry. It's the solution to anxiety. Anxiety which is so destructive it is inwardly directed. Whether it's the thoughts in our heads going pointlessly round and round in the middle of the night or dark emotions in our hearts. But these petitions are, be taken to God, are to be taken to God with thankfulness. So which prayer is more likely to reduce our anxiety? Try these two. Prayer one. Look God, I'm really short of money, so just sort it out, will you? Prayer two. Heavenly Father, you're a good God. You have created me. You've given everything I need in life. I'm thankful for how you've looked after me, uh, even up to today. What a great God you are. But God, I don't have enough money to get me through this week. Please would you be gracious to me once again to provide me with just enough to get through. Which of those two prayers, if you prayed them, would reduce your anxiety? I think it's probably the second one. Let's be honest, which prayer is God more likely to say yes to? Certainly the second one. When we follow the example of Jesus and we rejoice upwardly in his sacrifice on the cross for us in God's matchless love and grace when we are gentle with those around us those we interact with outwardly and when we take our requests to God in thankful prayer to counteract our inward anxieties then Paul writes in verse 7 and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus the result of following these three commands, which I've termed as being the roots of peace, is this peace of God. Why does it transcend all understanding? Because the world thinks of peace as a response to circumstances. And so it cannot understand why a Christian would be rejoicing during struggles. Why we would be gentle to all despite conflict. Or how we could be free of anxiety during a crisis. The world cannot understand why Christians can have the peace of God. So having achieved this peace, this peace that depends on God and not our circumstances, then, then it's great, right? We're good, we can just sit back. This peace will guard our hearts, that is our emotions. It's going to guard our minds, that's our thoughts. So we just relax. The world can be falling to bits around us. And we're sitting on a high mountain going, um. Isn't that what we, we mean then when we say we want peace? Well, it might be what we mean, but that is not peace as God sees it. The peace of God is not a passive thing. It is a working thing, an active thing. And so our second section, the fruits of peace. We ask the question, what does peace look like? We're going to look at our mental resources, our practice, and the God of peace. Our mental resources. Some of you are having to do homeschooling for your kiddos right now. You're remembering your own school lessons, trying to think about quadratic equations and all those kind of things. I wouldn't have a clue. Uh, if I remember my physics lessons, I think there was something about how nature will always fill a vacuum. We need something to take the place of our ungentle thoughts and of our, our anxieties that the peace of God has removed. We need to refill our minds then with mental resources. Resources that we can draw on in times of trouble. A mental bank account that we can make withdrawals from in a crisis like COVID-19. And Paul tells us what we need to fill our minds up with. Six things. Finally, brothers and sisters, verse 8. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He says we're, the, these, these things are both excellent and praiseworthy there. Obviously their opposites are things then that we shouldn't be dwelling on. They aren't excellent and praiseworthy. 
So what are these six things? Just very briefly we should think on, we should savour what is true. The Bible, God's nature, the good news about Jesus, the fellowship of our local church, not conspiracies, not fake news, rumour and gossip, not our own pet theories. Paul says we should be contemplating whatever is noble. Stay away from the dishonourable. Don't take pleasure from disrespectful things. Whatever is right, whatever is just, we might say. Think on these things. God loves justice. And if we can learn anything from history, it is that injustice has nothing to do with peace. He goes on, whatever is pure, think on this. It might be true, it might be true that something is not harmful to another person, but is it pure? If not, it will stand against the peace of God. Whatever is lovely, we must not give ourselves over to the grotesque. We're not talking about physical beauty here or, or art, those kind of things. This is how God sees things, the, what we can understand that he finds of value. And lastly, whatever is admirable. Whatever we might recommend to someone else, whatever we might commend to someone else, what would we recommend to family and friends as contributing to their peace? If we can't recommend it to them because it's not admirable, we can't recommend it for our own peace, can we? So stop thinking about it. As an example, what are you watching on social media right now? I mean, okay, you're watching me right now. I get that. But I mean, I mean more generally during lockdown. If you're coming across conspiracy theories, unhelpful, unhelpful memes, crude videos, or, or, or something you would never share with your grandmother, then what do you find yourself doing? Okay, your first thought is, whoa, wow. But what then? Can I suggest to you that a mind not guarded by the peace of God is likely to find itself following that trail, following those clicks attached to it. And before you know where you are, you spent an hour filling your mind up the stuff that you're going to be recycling later in your mind, either consciously or unconsciously, in unhelpful ways. That stuff is going to set us thinking and feeling things that will detract from our peace, will detract from how we should live our lives. That stuff is not a good resource for us in the future. It is not good fruit. What Paul is saying here is that a mind that is guarded by the peace of God will leave that trail of thought or only follow it shortly perhaps and will then go and find something true, noble, right, pure and lovely and which you could recommend to your grandma. This is fruit because this content is then available to us either consciously or unconsciously, consciously, when we are living out our lives, particularly when we have to live in a crisis. Maybe we'll need it emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Maybe we'll need to uh, pass it to someone else because it's admirable and it's just going to be what they need at that time. This fruit of peace can be a ready resource, rooted in joy and gentleness and prayer that we can deploy. So the mind is not passive, having received the word of God. Neither is the body. The second fruit of peace I want to suggest to you is what we put into practice. Look there in verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. That is what we do day to day in life. Those things that we've learned and received and heard and seen from from anybody okay we don't want to be the originator of some of these things in our lives but neither do, neither do we just want to get it from somebody we want it to be rooted objectively outside ourselves but from someone who we can trust and rely on well the word there in verse 8 received gives us the clue Used in the Bible, it generally relates to something that has been received from someone else and is now being passed on. So in this case, something Paul has received and is now being passed to the, the church in Philippi and to us. 
We see Paul use it in the same way at the start of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You can read that there later. Paul and the other writers of the New Testament have passed on to us what they have received, what they have learned and seen and heard from Jesus so that we might put it into practice. This is the peace of God in action. It is the fruit of the peace of God in our lives that's guarding our hearts and minds, our imitation of Jesus. Doing the best we can to follow his commands. We are called to live out this peace that we have been given. Many of the circumstances that require peacemaking take place in the, in the messiness of relationships, in the circumstances, the providence of life, in pandemics. Not on some mountain top or in a cave in the hill somewhere. Following these commands takes us to the third fruit of peace. If the first fruit is our mental resources and our second is our practice, the third is the God of peace himself. Look there again in verse 9. And the God of peace will be with you. Let me read you from another part of the Bible, the book of John, uh, chapter 14, verse 21. This is something Jesus said. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them and show myself to them. Jesus says that following his commands is something we will do because we love him, not because we have to. And then we will be loved by God, the father and Jesus. And notice at the end of that verse that Jesus will show himself to us. There is a level of fellowship that we receive, that we can uh, enjoy as a fruit of peace in our life. The God of peace will be with us. The ultimate resource for us in a crisis. The most valuable thing that we have during the coronavirus is this third fruit of peace. God himself. Once we have got our heads around the idea of peace that, that Paul is talking about here, once we've learned to rejoice, to rejoice in the Lord, to be gentle and to make thankful petitions to God to overcome our anxiety. When we filled our mind with whatever is true and noble and pure, once we've put into practice what we have heard and learnt from the life of Jesus, then we will have the God of peace himself. In Ephesians chapter 2 it, said, it says God himself is our peace. That's the peace I want. That's the peace I want to experience. The presence of the God of peace. So let me encourage you. To make this part of Philippians, this, this brief section from chapter 4, a guide to you. We need the peace of God in our lives more than ever. More than ever right now in the coronavirus, we need the God of peace to be with us. Again in the book of John, it recalls Jesus saying this. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, there is so much that is not peaceful in our lives right now. Heavenly Father, we turn to your word for guidance. Help us to put into practice what Paul is passing on to us here. May this, these commands, put into action in our lives. Truly give us 
the peace of God that transcends all understanding. And Lord, as we then take that peace and enjoy the fruits of it, the mental resources that we can store up for crisis situations and other troubles in our lives, as we put into action the things you have taught us through your Son, Jesus, Lord, we pray that we would, even today, know that the God of peace is with us. We ask it in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.